Fleet's Journal. Two years. They're telling me it's been two years. All of that time wasted in fruitless argument with my brother. And yet, it only felt like two hours in the embrace. Yet it must be true. My body feels weak sluggish. My attempts at conditioning have not yielded results as quickly as I had hoped, forcing drastic action. There was a time when I would have considered taking my own life rather than joining the companions, but now I find myself resolved to join them. It would seem my life is thick with irony these days. There is no doubt that it will take time for me to recover fully, and I feel as if I owe Delphine an explanation for my absence. It's a wonder she didn't beat the door down. Our meeting was not what I expected. I had anticipated anger, but instead she expressed relief. Perhaps she knew more of my situation than I had realized. I have never given her credit, not the credit she deserves, for her dedication to the cause of Skyrim, and she is a Breton no less. We discussed the status of her investigation, and it would seem she has been stalled the last two years trying to find this Esburn. But she assures me that she is close to locating him. I can only hope that when the time comes, I am ready. Master Featherstone, I know our brotherhoods have had their differences in the past, but even so, I have always respected you as a commander of honor and excellence on the field of battle. You and I are both soldiers, and soldiers know when to fight and when to lay down weapons and talk. When you withdrew to your fortress, Many took that as a sign of weakness and reveled in your absence. News of the events at the Broken Tower traveled like a grass fire across the province. I can tell you in the days and weeks that followed, there was much gloating among my brothers and sisters, and I am ashamed to admit that I was among those who lifted a mug to the defeat of the burned company. I think back on that time with shame when I consider what you and your crew must have gone through. There is glory in this life that we have chosen, but there is also heartache. I am a simple man, but even a warrior knows when the world around him has suffered a mortal blow. Over the last two years, I have come to realize how much the province needs leaders such as you. I have seen the people lose hope that the Dragonborn would return. I have seen the Civil War spin to an intensity never seen before. 
That is why I write this letter. When I heard that you had awoken from your slumber, my heart rejoiced. And when Lydia approached me for help, I resolved to do my part. I have been made to understand that you face most severe physical challenges, and I would like to help you get back into fighting shape. Your Vasker is where champions are made, and it would be my honor to count you as a companion. There are members of the Circle who still harbor ill will toward the Burned Company, so we will need to be discreet until you have proven yourself worthy to be counted among the companions. There will be no special treatment for the Dragonborn. You will have to work for your place, just as everyone else, and earn the respect of your shield brothers and sisters, but I assure you that we will whip you into fighting shape. I hope you will accept my hand of help and friendship. I extend this hand in humility and fellowship to a mighty warrior and hope that you will do the companions the great honor of joining our ranks. With deep respect, Kodlak Whitemate, Harbinger. Dearest Nefei, it has been so long since last we spoke, but I know at the time your pain was most crippling and I left abruptly. The circumstances of Fleet's identity as Sumerian surely must have seemed like a betrayal to you. I must confess that Little Feather's true nature was hidden even from me though I professed to be as a father to him for many years. I regret many things from the days of his youth and believe now that I failed him utterly. Though I have no right to ask anything of you, I hope that you will read my words and consider them with your heart rather than your mind. The future of Tamriel may depend on the decisions we make in the coming weeks. Fleet needs you now more than ever before. Since the tragic events of the Broken Tower, Fleet has been in a perpetual catatonic state. His body is at least partially sustained by magics I cannot begin to comprehend. But even so, he's wasting away. His eyes move, indicating his mind is active, but he seems unable or unwilling to return to our reality. Our last hope may be that your voice would bring him back to us. I believe the world needs him, Nefei. I plead with you to remember the man he was when you were together not the petulant youth who caused your family so much despair. See him for the man he became and not the boy he left behind. Remember the man who pulled you from prison and took you in. 
A man who taught you how to survive and had expectations of you. That man is complicated, but he loves you, and now he needs your help. Perhaps your heart remains filled with hatred. Perhaps you can never forgive Little Feather for all that he did in his youth. Even so, consider what you deny the world. Fleet has a destiny that is woven into the very fabric of the world in which we all live. I have come to understand that he is the mythical dragonborn and that his power and destiny are real. Tamriel needs him. We all need him to recover. If you cannot be moved by the man he has become, then consider for a moment the boy he was. Lonely, friendless, abandoned, and abused. His mother lost to him and his father a monster who would see him imprisoned and turned into a mindless tool for his own dark purposes. Think of the lot he was born into and then consider the father that the gods blessed you with. The loss of your father was a tragedy beyond comprehension, but consider what your life might have been like, devoid of that love, brief as it was, and tell me that this is a man worth nothing. I have said all that I can say, child. My heart cries out for you and this boy as well. I hope that you can find a way to reconcile all of this madness and come to his aid, not as an apprentice, for you are no longer that, but as a friend who loves who he is, not who he was. Hold it. Fleet's Journal. Codlack was true to his word. I was admitted to the Companions without trouble, but that is where the favors end. In the days since my arrival, I have been treated as any other newcomer, subject to jibes, made to run meaningless errands, fetch food for the Circle, and even clean and repair their clubhouse. It is humiliating work, to be sure but not unwarranted. New members of any martial organization worth a damn must have their metal tested, and among the most important traits of any member of an organization such as this are those of patience and humility, traits I did not have in abundance as a younger man. With much experience now behind me, I understand the wisdom of the practice this knowledge does not make me want to slap them any less. 
but I understand its importance. Kodlak proved to be very adept at bringing me into the fold without letting on that he knew who I was. I am certain the rest of them have no idea that the Dragonborn walks among them. It is crucial that I keep up the ruse until I can prove my worth. I crossed swords with one called Vilkis on my first day. His strikes were so powerful, my arm ached for hours after our encounter. It took considerable control to keep the hints of pain from my face. In many ways, pain is all I have now. Pain of my weakened body and the pain of loss. Losing Palandrian Berg is the most difficult pain to take. My time in the embrace seemed like the blink of an eye when, in fact, it amounted to years in reality. For me, the pain of their loss is fresh, and the guilt of my responsibility for their sacrifice unbearable. I'm being sent to Morthal to deal with a thug who needs to be put in his place. Apparently, he has been bullying merchants in town, and they have entered into a contract to have the companions deal with him. This is exactly the kind of shit that caused me to despise the denizens of Yorvaskar years ago. Now I am the thug. Life has a way of playing sick jokes on a man. Welcome, dear viewers, to Couch Warrior TV on YouTube. I'm the Couch Warrior, and you are watching Featherstone, an Aranus Arcana story featuring Fleet Featherstone, the arcane archer assassin, and his uh, company of companions, I guess. So, wow, here we are, back again after all this time to continue the story. I'm glad to be back, and I am so glad that you all are with me and excited about the project. I really do appreciate it. So, it's a little bit overwhelming, to be honest, all the stuff that we have to cover, um, all the things we have that are worth talking about. Uh, so, I, I understand we're probably not going to be able to get to all this stuff in one episode. There's just a lot of territory to cover when it comes to, uh, you know, discussing where we're at in the story, discussing what the way forward is, talking about things like format, presentation, how this is going to work, uh, what's been done to this point, all that good stuff. So we're going to spread it out over several episodes, and uh, believe me, we'll get everything covered. So this is uh, amazing and fantastic. It has been, well, a long time. The story began... For, for those of you who uh, were not diehard followers of the first, I guess, technically four acts in the story, it started back in 2013 as a Let's Play featuring this character on the Xbox. And it eventually evolved onto PC and be began to include mods. By the time we were all done, I think it was, you know, probably around a hundred and... I don't know. I don't know, was it about 110 or so episodes 
in the story. We better take care of some stuff here and then we'll we'll keep talking. We got an archer. He's gonna try and make us pay. We very much don't want to pay this time. Make or miss, make or miss, make or miss, bob and weave. Oh. Okay, there we go. Now let's dip back in here. These archers are going to give us a hard time. Okay, one of the big differences between the previous incarnation of the story and this one is that this time around I am doing the commentary live as I play, whereas before the commentary was done after. Uh, so, ooh, mage. Gotcha. Charging power attack. Hey, watch it. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, that guy makes me nervous. Let's get us some extra room. Basically, what that means is that when we get into these combat sequences, I'm going to be distracted. I'm not going to be able to talk about what we're doing, you know, and I'm not going to be talk about be able to talk about role play. I kind of have to focus on what I'm going to do here if I want to stay alive. So. them on a merry chase. I'm going to be careful here. I mean, these these guys could take us out if we're not careful. Now, we are currently on our way to do a little bit of a, an intimidation mission. Pretty minor thing for the companions. But in order to get it done, we've got to get to Morthal, which means uh, we got to kind of get through this area, which is typically our, our shortcut to Morthal. Oh, we got spotted again. Let's change position again here. Bear. <laughs> Whoa, he's a big boy. Everybody's pissed at Fleet right now. Wouldn't have it any other way, would we? Yeah, that's Mr. Bear over there. Okay, we took care of everybody down here, I guess. Technically, we could continue on. I think we're going to do that. I think we're going to cut our losses and continue on here. I think we've got a body we can loot here, though, just in case. Eh. Nothing of particular value there. Whoa, 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 whoa.
he going to do? Lay down, stand up, charge. Okay. We're going to try and be smart about this if we can. Okay, so, boy, here we are, and a, and a lot has happened. There is a lot to explain. There are some things I will explain just flat out and that we'll discuss. There's other things I'm not going to explain because my intent is to explain them through other elements of the story, whether it be a backstory or, a, you know, a flashback or, you know, some, some other piece of narrative that's going to reveal some of those mysteries. Oh, shit. Let's just run it. Get up there. Ugh, oh, come on. Sweet Jesus. Out here. Is that him hiding out right there? Gotcha. Alright, he's done. Any other surprises waiting for us here? <clears throat> so, fleet has had some difficulties. Now, when we last left off, Sumerian had successfully assassinated the Emperor. And in the very few episodes that constituted Act 4, we saw Fleet also assemble a group of mercenaries called the Burned Company. Now, some things have transpired with the burned company. We don't know exactly what yet, but what we can gather from the letter that we had from Haldir to Nefei is that something transpired with the burned company at a place called the Broken Tower that caused Fleet to go into something like, I guess, a state of being sort of almost in a coma. Kind of a semi-conscious state. And he was in this state, according to the letter, for two years. During that time, he ate and drank very little, but was his body was apparently sustained by some magic that Haldir could not explain. However... Uh, Haldir did indicate that despite that, despite that fact, Fleet's body is not what it used to be. So, in other words, uh, you know, he's being sustained by magic, but even so... Even so, he's in a weakened state from what he was before. And now, uh, the long and the short of it here is that he has been invited by Kodlak to join the companions secretly in order to get his legs back under him. And what we are led to understand is that uh, this is an opportunity for Fleet to recover, but also an opportunity for Kodlak to potentially bring prestige to the Companions by actually having the Dragonborn become a member of the Companions. What we understand, however, is that from Act 4, there were some letters or journal entries from Haldir that indicated that uh, Fleet, back in those days, had very little respect at all 
for the companions, and that in fact there had been some kind of confrontation between the burned company and the companions on the streets of Whiterun that caused a lot of bad blood. Missed him. So it's kind of a big deal that that fleet is joining the companions. You get you get the sense that over the course of time these two men, these two seasoned warriors, have gained a respect for one another and have come to understand that <clears throat> there, is, there are more important things at stake in Skyrim than the reputations of their various organizations. And those differences are being put aside. for the sake of the province. What Codlek has indicated is that because of the bad blood, he is going to make this offer to Fleet to join the companions, but Fleet is going to have to do it sort of incognito, not revealing who he really is to other members of the companions until he has uh, built up, up enough respect among the group that it might be safe to do so. However, the letter indicates, obviously, from, from what we're reading, the fact that the letter was sent at all indicates that Kodlak himself, personally, has a lot of respect for Fleet and feels that Fleet's presence in the world is necessary, um, that, that Fleet needs to continue in his role as the Dragonborn if the province of Skyrim is going to survive whatever it is that it's going through right now. Um, he specifically mentions the Civil War kind of spinning out of control uh, and the dragon menace being unchecked. So when you think about that, we've got an interval of time here uh, since the end of Act 4 of two years which have passed. And it stands to reason that in two years' time, the Civil War could have gotten much worse than it was when we left the story off in Act 4. And likewise, uh, the Dragon Menace could be much more severe as well. More dragons, bigger threat, and completely unchecked by the Dragonborn, whose role it is uh, to destroy them. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot... A lot that could have transpired during those two years. And rest assured that anything important that has happened during those two years, I will reveal to you through the story. So don't worry that you're going to miss anything. Uh, I feel as though I'm a pretty thorough storyteller, so I will try to hit anything there that is relevant, that is going to be important to Fleet and his crew, the story we're trying to tell here. So no worries there. All right, we got more trolls. Okay, so let's let's talk about some particulars here. <clears throat> now, it's important it's important that that everybody is able to sort of keep track of not only the story, but how this presentation of the story is different than last time. Firstly, this is a continuation. This is a continuation of the story that we were sharing together three years ago. I am not picking it up right where it left off, obviously. I'm creating this buffer of two years' time, and that, that buffer is great from a storytelling perspective because it gives me an opportunity to kind of you know, go back and explain some things that may have happened in the intervening time in an interesting way if I want to. Uh -huh. But just note that, okay? Make a note of that. Now, the format change. Uh, the, the format is going to be roughly the same in that I'm going to be telling the story through a combination of letters, journal entry, constructed dialogue, um, and commentary. 
So the format of this thing is is going to be almost identical to how it was before. I think the two big differences here are that the production values are going to go way up. Uh, the imagery should be better. Uh, the audio production should be better. The presentation should be much more polished because I have learned a lot uh, in four years and I have upgraded all the tools that I'm using and, and all that stuff. Uh, and then the other important point is that this commentary is being recorded as I play. In the first four acts, the commentary was recorded after. So I did the gameplay, I would put the video together, and then I would lay the commentary down over the top of the video as a track afterwards, kind of dubbing it in, right? Uh, my setup now allows me to kind of do things on the fly and, and have it come out like I'd want to. I think nice nice and clean but what that means is that during the course of gameplay I will quite often be more distracted so uh, what that's gonna mean is that when we get into uh, you know heavy details about character development and uh, and narrative and stuff like that I'm going to have to be in a position to actually concentrate on what it is that I'm talking about, which means those things will tend to happen in the quiet moments. Sometimes the quiet moments are going to be moments like this, when we're traveling bet between, you know, uh, two important points in the story. In the past, I was able to kind of just follow along with the video and concentrate on all of my commentary as I was doing it, and, and it had my undivided attention. Um, that's just not possible now. All right, hand over your value. Oh first, boy. Or I will gut you like a fish. Hmm. I don't have time for this. Walk away now. Well, I, <clears throat> I can see you're not one to be trifled with. Let this be a warning to you. Yeah. Out of my face. That spider's gotta go. Where did that asshole come from? Oh, here we go. Ow. Okay, some other important points is that uh, I am now... The, the fleet experience has migrated once again, and we have moved from Legacy Skyrim to Skyrim SE, which means that this is a from-scratch recreation of fleet. This is not a saved game that I plucked from the last story where I ended and resumed. This is a completely rebuilt from the bottom-up character. I have played through the quests with this character that I feel needed to be played through in order to continue the story. So that's also a very important distinction. I don't want anybody to get the mistaken impression that I simply picked up an old save and just continued on because that would have been impossible. Now it also gave me the opportunity to go through and clean some things up, add some mods, take away some mods that we weren't using. It also means that we have a nice clean save. Uh, but I was able to recreate Fleet, and I tried to map his activities as closely as I could to the things that we had done in the first part of the story, so that when we got back to this point, uh, Fleet would be at, at roughly the right level with the right skills. Now, also important to mention is a, another uh, worthy distinction here, which is that uh, with this iteration of Fleet Featherstone. We are using the Ordinator perk overhaul. I have had to kind of translate the vanilla perks that Fleet had from the previous story into Ordinator perks for the new story, okay, for the continuation of the story. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to point out here is that Fleet in, in preparation for continuation of the story, um, 
it's not a save that's been picked up. It's not anything that's been converted. Uh, he has been lovingly recreated from scratch, played through the levels, played through the quests, and that's why it has taken me so long from the time uh, of announcing his return to the beginning of the story is because I needed time to go back through the old episodes, remember everything that he had done, make notes on that stuff, create a new character, and actually play it through to the point where uh, he is at the right level and kind of in the right place for continuation of the story. So when we left off, we were at roughly level 50 or 51. If you look here, we're continuing the story. He's basically been in suspended animation for a couple of years, right? Um, his skills, uh, his, his level is still there, all right? So we're, we're kind of picking, uh, picking it right up where we left off with the with the special distinction that we have converted some perks to Ordinator, all right? All right, now, there is a guy around here in Morthal who's looking to get a beaten. We've got to find him. Let's do that. All right, brothers and sisters, this is where we're at. As part of the Companion's quest line, one of the very first things you must do is that Farkas will send you on an intimidation mission. There he is, right there. That's the guy we got to fight. And that's what we're here to do. Now, one of the problems here is that the intimidation mission that Farkas assigned to us upon joining the companions was to go and intimidate Adrian Avenici. And if you know anything about the first three acts of this story, you know that in our story, that particular NPC was killed by a vampire. And her death at the hands of the vampires... Uh, was a major point of discussion and was uh, really formative when it came to uh, Fleet and eventually Sumerian's opinions about vampires. So fighting Adrian Avenici is not an option for us just because it doesn't work with the story. So my solution to that problem is that we are going to fight this guy instead. But the other issue here is that this guy is going to be much more difficult for us to fight than than Adrian would have been. So he, he is many degrees of difficulty higher when it comes to fist fighting than she would have been. So fighting her, the fight would have been over pretty quickly. Here, there's a good chance that this guy could pummel us to death. So we need to take every advantage we can. You, If you remember, um, in the first part of the story, I think it was in Act 3, we actually got into a fist fight with Burguk that did not end well. Um, I was not expecting to have as difficult a time fist fighting Burguk as we ended up having, so uh, really important that we not screw this up. So one of the things that we, we know about, about Fleet, about Sumerian, is that he, he may be an honorable guy, generally speaking, but he is also not someone who is going to risk the mission uh, for the sake of being honorable. So we are going to give ourselves every advantage. Now, I like how this sort of plays into the character's situation as well. What we know is that, you know, Fleet is, you know, a couple years older. He is, you know, he is thinner. He is leaner. He is, is not, not nearly as as strong or as muscle-bound a character as he was back then. So his understanding here is that, he, you know, he recognizes the fact that he's not in peak condition and he's going to have to try and do what he can. So we're going to put an enchantment on our gloves to try and give ourselves an advantage. Okay. We can sacrifice a flawless gem to make new enchantments placed upon items of the corresponding types 25% stronger. This is a perk in the enchantment tree that I have taken that is part of Ordinator. Uh, we are going to sacrifice a flawless sapphire 
which will give us some bonus on this enchantment. We're going to use this. What we're going to do is we're going to put it on our gauntlets. We are going to use a grand soul gem to make it as powerful as we can. And then what we're looking for is fortify unarmed. And fortify unarmed is an enchantment that we acquired. in Riften as part of the Thieves' Guild quest line. Gloves of the Pugilist, I believe, had this enchantment on them. We disenchanted those um, in the previous acts of our story here. So we're going to use that now. All right. Hopefully that is going to give us the advantage we need to come out on top in this brawl. Um, I'm still concerned. This will, without a doubt, just be a click fest, okay? Like, click, click, click. And I'm using a very high DPI mouse, so I apologize if there is any camera shaking or things going on due to the rapid-fire clicking that's going to be going on when we engage in this brawl. Of course, we've got to find him. It's possible he may have gone inside the inn now. So we'll see if we can find him in there. But the, the important thing I'm trying to note here is that I am filling a hole in the story or a problem pres presented by the default quest lines by building my own. This is something that we discuss a lot, is how do we string all these quests together and stuff like this. I am solving a problem here. Yeah. Pick up your boots, stay a while. Let me know if there's anything I can help you with. I right. Got nothing but time these days. Where did this guy go? Yeah, I'm coming into your place here just to start a fight. So we've got to sort of prove ourselves to the companions. And of course, the first thing they want us to do is just to get into a fist fight with somebody they're trying to intimidate. It's it's Basically, thuggery is what it is, but Fleet is certainly not a stranger to thuggery either. This is not unlike some of the work that we've done for the Thieves Guild in the past. Where did he go? Well, let's go down here. Let's wander across the bridge, see if he went down this way. If he's not down there, we'll turn around and come back, and that's fine. So this is what I'm going to do. There are obviously a lot of complicated details here as we continue the story. And if you remember in the first three acts, one of the things that we did a lot is we had a lot of great discussions in the, the comments section here on YouTube. Um, I invite you to ask any questions um, you, you have there. Uh, be nice about it, please. Be polite about it. Um, and I will do what I can to answer those questions. If I feel like the the question, the, the answer to your question is something that would compromise some the story in some way by either taking it down a path I don't want it to go or by revealing some key point in the narrative that I that I'm not interested in talking about yet. I'll just let you know politely. <laughs> you know, it's not a big deal at all. Um, we are all in the process of trying to get reacquainted with where we are in the story. If you are interested in in boning up on the story and getting, getting familiar with what's happened up to this point, I would invite you to go out to charactercrusade.com. Uh, you can... You can go to it, the shortcut there is if you go to featherstone.charactercrusade.com, that will take you straight to the Featherstone section of the Character Crusade website. Otherwise, you can navigate to it just through the regular website. Here he is, right here. And you're going to find episode guides there. You can use the episode guides to get caught up on the story. And what the episode guides will do is they will provide you with a link to the episode, but then also give you a bulleted list of the things that took place in that episode that were really important to character development, important to the narrative, or discussions that we had during commentary that were important to the techniques that we're using here to build this role play. 
Okay, he's going in here. We're going to fight it out with him in here. All right, now, fingers crossed. This is... The, the, there, there are two important things here. One is that I, I need to win this fight. Quiet place, but then the world used to make sense. And I also need to come away from this without having carpal tunnel. So <laughs> it could be kind of hard. Best warrior in Morthal, and that's no boast. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're gonna try to take it. I bet a hundred gold I can take you barehanded. Right. Here we go. Here we go. It's click fest time. Get ready. Just your own two hands. Weapons and magic are I got out. you. Now, if I now use a potion, got. or I use any magic here, on, it's going to compromise. It's going to compromise the fight, and he'll come after me with weapons, and the guards will come after me, and everything. So, That's it. That's slow and steady got. wins the race here. Come on. Come on, fleet. You can do this. We've got. Major reserves of stamina. I'm not worried about that, but I am worried about our health. I got my hands up, lady. God, look at her. She's like a referee or something. Okay, come on. Yes. Beat down. Ooh. Oh, wow. That made all the difference. I do not believe that we could have beat him. Hey, how about my hundred gold? All right, shut up, lady. It's all over. Nothing to see here. All right. You've been a good friend to me. I that have. something. All right. All right then. All right, mission accomplished. That was uh, not as bad as I thought. I realized early into the fight too that I had my uh, my HUD turned off, so <laughs> I had no idea where I was with the hit points or anything like that. That could have been a disaster. All right, so let's head back. So as you can imagine, um, you know, playing playing through the material to try to bring the character back up to level fifty one was was interesting. Um, I also spent a lot of time poring over the the old episodes, rewatching. 100 plus episodes of my own story to try and make sure that um, I had most of the details down. I think it's really important to note that I'm not going to get them all. There, there's going to be some holes. Uh, I mean, it has been. I mean, this whole thing started in 2013, so it's been a while. But uh, the important thing is, do we have the essence of the story? Do we understand the character. So I think uh, one of the things that is critical that we do early on is refamiliarize ourselves with with who Fleet is um, by by looking back at some of the things that have happened, some of the things that we've discussed before, and using that as a bit of a measuring stick to kind of determine where he is now. Let's let's start that conversation by talking a bit about the split, okay? So, in Act 1 of Fleet's story, he was very much a solitary operator, low level, starting at level 10, right? And I consider Act 1 to be sort of his coming of age story if you will his independence right he's 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 escaped into skyrim he's a bit of an outlaw he's come here searching for for linway who he believes has has betrayed him so 
on the one hand, he's coming for revenge, but on the other hand, he's, he's also coming to try and lose himself. He's running from something. And what we come to discover over the course of Act 1 is that he seems to be running away from the influence of his father. Not that he's running in terror from his father, but that he doesn't want to be under the thumb of his father. And then as we get uh, into Act 2, we discover that he is a person who has a hole in his heart. You know, he's he's got... He, he's a person who is doesn't have anything spiritual in his life. And that is the first time that we hear reference to this phrase, you know, kind of referring to him as the vessel. A as if he were um, an empty vessel waiting to be filled. And what comes along to fill that vessel in Act 2 but Sithis and the Dark Brotherhood? And he discovers something akin to religion. And what we see him do over the course of Act 2 is not only become involved with the Dark Brotherhood, but in a, in a way almost reinvent the spirituality that surrounds Sithis. And there's a, there's a lot of talk of Sithis, and he spends um, a lot of time in Act 2 sort of getting in touch with his spiritual self. And that's where we start to see the separation between him and Astrid as Fleet, the listener, represents the spiritual aspects of the Dark Brotherhood. And Astrid seems to represent the secular aspects of the Dark Brotherhood. And they come into conflict, if you will. Okay? And it is also in Act 2, the transition from Act 2 to Act 3, that we start to understand that the dark side of Fleet that we see exhibited in, in the story is, is beginning to look a lot more as if it were a separate entity. And there is some question as to whether or not, you know, is Fleet possessed by an evil spirit or what is going on? And so it is, then, at the end of Act 3 that we see a physical separation between this entity that lives within him and attempts to manipulate him called Sumerian and Fleet. So, you know, Act 2 is kind of about the birth of Sumerian, the birth of the idea of Sumerian, uh, Act 3 is about the ongoing battle or the struggle for power between Fleet and Sumerian, ultimately culminating at the end of Act 3 and into the beginning of Act 4 in a separation between the two, which is represented by this encounter with Fleet's, the spirit of Fleet's dead mother, Valeria, who offers her soul to save Fleet's. And essentially, at that point, what Fleet becomes is he becomes a man who has two distinct entities living inside him, each with a separate soul, spirit, set of desires. And what she bestows upon Fleet is not only the gift of a soul, but the gift of an ability or a place known as the embrace, a place where he can go and he can actually meet with his quote-unquote brother, Sumerian, in physical form, and they can talk, they can negotiate, um, they can discuss ideas, they can fight, they can argue, they can do all of these things in the embrace. The mechanics of this, uh, which we discussed um, a bit in Act 3 and 4, is that whereas before, any time Fleet was doing something, because he shared a soul and shared a body with Sumerian, Sumerian was able to monitor everything that he was doing. He was able to see what Fleet was doing. He was able to manipulate Fleet. Uh, but now what we've done is we've created a, a more distinct separation in that 
when fleet is contr in control of the vessel, Sumerian is not able to monitor what he's doing, is not able to control him in any way, is not able to speak to him, and vice versa. So when Sumerian is con in control, fleet is in the embrace, doing God knows what. And the, the reverse is true. When fleet is in control, Sumerian is in the embrace. And it is possible for both of them to engage this power that we call the embrace to meet in this strange kind of nether world and speak to one another and debate about what they're going to do. Essentially, what, what Valeria did is she provided a platform or a safe place in, in which they can go to discuss their differences and to work through them. It forced negotiation. It forced them to figure out how to work together. And of course, this is a work in progress. So it's important to note that. And when we have sequences that take place in the embrace, those are the times when you're going to be able to see the two characters together actually interacting with one another. Otherwise, what we're seeing right now is Fleet is in control here, or Empyrean, the entity that we've come to call Empyrean. And so what I like to think of is that Fleet, the man, is the physical form, and there are three entities. There is Empyrean, there is Sumerian, and then there is this entity that we call Fleet, who kind of represents the, the vessel, if you will, that both of these entities live within and share control of. So both of them have a vested interest in making sure that their physical form, their shared physical form, is, is healthy. You know, otherwise their ability to impact the world is limited. And so we create this interesting dynamic where there's this constant push and pull as, as each of them Mister, tries to coin? maintain control. I'm so hungry. Oh, thank you. Divines, bless your kind heart. All right, then. Certainly, child. So that's important thing, and it, you know, it's... It can be somewhat confusing uh, sometimes, but I, I think for those of us who have had the opportunity, of course, to follow the story since the beginning and see this gradually happen, see all the stages of this transformation, it makes perfect sense. So anytime, you know, I, I can come back to this and we can talk about it. If, if there is any confusion over it, I'm happy to address it. So, all right, let's go. Skior says that I have the strength of Isgrimor, and my brother has his smarts. Right. Some people don't think I'm smart. Those people get my fist. But you, I like. Took I care of the problem. You had it in you. Nicely done. All right. You got more work? Skior was looking for you earlier. What does he want? Don't know. He just said he needed to talk to you before you do anything else. I don't like making him angry, but there is some work for you if you want it. All right. Some of them might try, but that's not what I'm worried about. What then? That they might get themselves killed. By you? They should be so lucky. Hmm. Hey. There you are. You wanted to see me? I did. Your time, it seems, has come. What do you mean by that? Last week, a scholar came to us. He said he knew where we could find another fragment of Wuthrak. He seemed a fool to me, but if he's right, the honor of the companions demands that we seek it out. What does this have to do with me? This is a simple errand, but the time is right for it to be your trial. Carry yourself with honor, and you'll become a true companion. Farkas will be your shield sibling on this venture. He'll answer any questions you have. Try not to disappoint, or to get him killed. Very well. Hmm. Hmm. 
Woothran. Tending to the warriors of your Vasco for as long as I can remember. All right. Let's do a little check here. Oh, yeah. It's late. Long day. We'll get some sleep. I see everything. And we'll talk to our shield brother in the morning. Conversation through the wall. Hmm. They're doing something that they know Codlac doesn't like or approve of. Interesting to note. All right, let's get some sleep. Before we do that. Something to eat here. We gotta cook some stuff here, I think. Oh yeah, we got a ton of stuff we gotta get get to cooking. Uh so a light snack. We don't want to eat anything heavy before bed. And off we go to sleep. I am so glad you chose to come. I know the roads can be difficult in these times. It was not difficult, old man. I came through the mountain passes into the reach. Ah, yes, very wise. Enough chat. Nefei, I must warn you, he is clearly conscious, but he is unresponsive. Do not be surprised if he does not acknowledge your presence. What is wrong with him? How did this happen? It is a complicated story, and I will share it all with you later, but for now, what you must know is that this is a sickness of the spirit. During the confrontation at Broken Tower, the Dramora used dark magic in an attempt to control him, but somehow he was able to counter the spell with a well of power from within himself. He resisted the dark power, but the effort left him in this state. Not everyone survived. You are talking about his burnt company. Yes, I am talking about the burnt company. How long has he been like this? It has been almost two years. Two years? Why did you not write me sooner, old man? How is it possible that he is even alive? If only we knew. There is something that sustains him, but I have not been able to determine what it is. Make no mistake, he is wasting away. His muscle mass is not what it used to be. But under these conditions, he should have been dead a long time ago. It is a great mystery, my dear. He sits quietly, save the occasional change of expression. Strange to think, he has not used his voice in two years. He looks well. Oh yes, I know, that is because we take turns. Miravel bathes him and keeps his hair trimmed. Lydia has taken to working his limbs daily. I think she believes her... Ministrations were helped to preserve the meat that is left on his frame. For my part, I read to him and attempt to feed him, although he rarely takes much more than water. How did this happen, Haldir? Someone must tell me the whole truth. 
It is a difficult story to tell, my dear. The story of the Byrne Company is a tragic one, to say the least, but there were also great moments of glory, and we often forget when faced with the horror and the pain of our defeats. We all have our pain, old man. If you want me to do any good, I need to know everything. Your words cut, girl, but nonetheless, you are right. The days leading up to the death of the Emperor were difficult ones. The torrent of revelations regarding the gifts of Valeria were overwhelming him. I was doing all I could to help him understand and navigate the chaos. It seemed there were not facts to be had, no precedent to measure any of this against. We found ourselves in completely new historical territory. However, despite our lack of understanding, the consequences of events were very apparent. Like it or not, Little Feather was faced with a very real situation of being dyad, two men in one body. Having done the research and followed him through the entire affair, I was the only one who truly understood the scope of what he was experiencing in those days. Imagine a life in which you are engaged in a never-ending battle with the one you hate most, with no hope of escape, no way to simply walk away and cool your emotions, locked in conflict for all time. It was at the height of this turmoil that he created the Burned Company. He called a meeting in Mar Karth and everyone came. He gave an eloquent speech and called upon us to join him in ending the Civil War. We all agreed. Despite our very backgrounds and beliefs, we all agreed because we believed in him, each of us for our own reasons. We immediately set out for solitude, but were rejected by the Imperial Army. The General was not willing to allow us to fight as a unit and could not stomach the idea of our band being out of uniform or appearing to be mercenaries. I I heard something. After hours of fruitless discussion, Little Feather walked away, and we determined to carve our own path. For many months, we did profoundly good work in the world. We rooted out vampires. We saved villages from the lawless bands of outlaws that roamed the countryside. We even sealed off the Illinalta Valley, creating a pocket of peace in land filled to bursting with chaos and death. We were all proud of our accomplishments. But I was proud of Little Feather and the leader he had become. It was at this time that Palandri came to me with a dagger and a story. It seems that months before, he and Berg found a dagger that was the twin of a weapon that Fleet had been carrying for some time. A style of dagger that was unmistakable and an exact replica for the one Little Feather had created with his own hands. I had often wondered what possessed him to create a weapon in the image of a woman's form. He would always brush me off with a joke, saying it felt good in his hand. That was his way when he didn't understand something. This, however, was something altogether different. He crafted the weapon himself, So, how could there be another? Palandri was convinced this was important, but he could not explain why he felt so. He said the dagger was found on a desecrated altar to Debella, 
and that as soon as he saw the blade, he recognized it as Fleet's workmanship and unique design. I, on the other hand, immediately turned my thoughts to the words of Melka, covenant made flesh. She had spoken of Littlefeather's destiny and that he must find his patron. Could it be that Littlefeather was tied in some way to Debella? I explained what I had learned about the covenant to Belandry, and we both presented the weapon to Littlefeather. We looked on, stunned, as he compared the blade with his own. They were identical in every way, even down to the battle scars. It was then that we began to plan our expedition to the Broken Tower. Littlefeather wanted to see the place for himself. As a band of seasoned professionals, the Burned had no difficulty in taking the tower. It was at the top that we found the shrine, splashed with blood by the Forsworn in their dark rituals. The form of the goddess Debella dominated the room. I cannot say what it was, but the shrine captured Fleet's full attention. He gazed at it for long moments, seeming to take in every detail. Palandry spoke calm and quiet words to him, comforting him as you might a frightened child. Perhaps he saw something in Fleet's disposition that I did not. He placed his hands on Fleet's shoulders and said, Boy, you have been chosen by the beautiful one. Do not be afraid to be joyful, for it is a great blessing. You have struggled for so long. Your spirit has been torn and your heart drowned in sorrow. Look to the light and let it go. Simple words on the surface made so much more meaningful when spoken by Palandry a Dunmer religious scholar. The room was silent for a moment, and then Littlefeather began to weep softly, releasing years of strain and torment. We all stood with him and shared his grief. For many leaders, this expression of emotion would have cost him the respect of his soldiers, but in that moment, we all came to realize how much we loved and respected him. Yes, he was a hard and complicated man, but he was noble. He was an honorable man trapped in a monumental struggle that none of us could truly understand. It was at that moment that we all understood we would follow him unto death out of nothing more than love to return home now. I have a gift for you from Daddy, especially made just for his own precious son. <laughs>
to the warriors of your Vasker for as long as I can remember. The latest recruit, right? Wait, is that right? Yes, that's right. Where is Farkas? It is early. Okay, let us find our shield brother. There he is right there, I think. Might head down to the meadery later. See what they're brewing up. We can smell the honey on the wind. Excellent idea. I hope you've read it yourself. So I'm told. Let's see if you impress. Yeah. Tell me about uh, Wuthrad. Isgramor was the hero who started the companions. Wuthrad was his weapon. He came from the ancient homeland One and killed all the elves. Circle, but not all of them, because some of them are still here. I don't think that's how the circle works. <laughs> yes, They're they are. The uh, I'm curious. Who was this... Scholar who gave you the information. A smart man came and told us about a blade piece. Skior thinks you should find it, and I'm supposed to watch you. Wow. You are dumber than a box of rocks. Why did Skior call this my trial? I want you to make sure you're honorable. If you are honorable and strong, then I can call you brother. All right. I'll meet you at Dustman's Cairn then. Don't delay, Shield Brother. Well, it's not all about brains, ladies and gentlemen. This will be our opportunity to, I guess, see how the companions operate as well. I suppose we are evaluating them as much as they are evaluating us. And I say us, ladies and gentlemen, because this is our story, not just mine. And that is what makes this medium for telling a story so special and so much more interesting than a book or a movie, in my opinion. New media storytelling allows the audience to be involved, and that's what the YouTube comments are for. So feel free to post your ideas, reflections on the story. Those are the comments that I am most interested in, frankly. Discussion about role play, storytelling character development those are the kinds of things that I really get enthusiastic about if you've got questions about mods and suggestions about mods I'm somewhat less interested in that because the focus of my channel is not on mods it's on storytelling now if you're interested in the mods that I'm using here I have a complete mod list on the website so if you go to featherstone.charactercrusade.com, you're going to find the mod list. It's linked on just about every page of the site, and I try to keep it current. Um, in other words, I'm, I'm updating it every so often. Not constantly, but I'm trying to keep it, you know, fairly fresh, so it's a good accounting of what I'm using here. And it's not very sophisticated. It is literally a screenshot of my mod list, but if you want to see what I'm using, that's the place to go. There's also some information there about uh, the hardware I'm running and stuff like that. If you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, please feel free to go there and check it out. Okay, so now Skior has called this our proving. Leads me to believe that he thinks there is going to be a challenge here. I guess we'll see.
it would seem that most of the inner circle of the companions are are heavy heavy armor types. However, uh, all of us whelps seem to be light armor folks. I think that's kind of an interesting distinction. Missed my jump. There we go. So one of the things that I think is is quite interesting, um, in the early parts of Act Three, we had these discussions about character development and specifically about character traits and uh, how a dichotomy in character traits can make a character more interesting. In other words, um, you know, humans are complex creatures and there are a lot of contradictions in people's behavior and attitudes about life and about the world. And I gave a brief accounting of some of my thoughts in that area specific to fleet. And some of the things that I talked about at the time were kind of interesting and then have um, a, a sort of an interesting new relevance now that we've hit the point where Sumerian and Empyrean have become two distinct personalities. So what I mean by that is at the time... I was discussing sort of this dichotomy that Fleet had going on, where he had the capacity, for example, to be compassionate and to also be ruthless, right? To be compulsive and calculating, bold and secretive. Um, I think the last one was uh, kind of fatalistic, but also a survivor. And uh, it, it made me start to think about how do those opposed traits change after the character splits into what are basically two distinct personalities. And uh, I started jotting these things down and, and trying to think about what would, what would a new set of traits be for each of these characters individually if we were to think of them as separate characters and I think they very much are they're they're two separate individuals now and it occurred to me as as I looked at those that if we were to assign attributes to say Empyrean or the character that for so long we have come to know as quote unquote fleet I think of him as having the attributes of compassion, compulsiveness, boldness, and perhaps being fatalistic. And I think that makes a lot of sense when we, when we look at how he uses swords and leads people and charges into battle and he's, he's, full, of, he's full of energy and vigor and passion, right? And then if we take a look at Sumerian, we see the opposed traits. Ruthness, ruthlessness, right? He's, he's calculating, secretive, and he's a survivor. Uh, and I, I just thought it was kind of interesting how I'd had these, this dichotomy of opposed traits that created the one man, but then when the two personalities split, the traits split as well. And we saw this kind of line drawn between these two and it was sort of informative as well it was interesting to think about how the personality that fleet had before the split was an amalgam of the traits of both of these characters mashed together and how after the split it seemed as though the traits split as well and so what we're doing now is we're on the road to developing 
the complex trait dichotomies of two separate characters now. And that is what is going to be taking place going forward. So we're going to start to see more complexity developing in the, the traits of Empyrean as this kind of new this new person, this newly independent person, as well as the same for Sumerian. So um, I, I think they're going to get more, more complex and interesting going forward, but I just thought that was kind of an interesting distinction to, to look at there. All right, here we are. Are you ready? We should keep moving. All right. Until next time. You want me to take point or what? Okay, let's head on in here. Looks like someone's been digging here, and recently. Levels. Looks like someone's been Tread digging lightly. here, and recently. So, Farkas. Hmm. Does it bother you at all that a scholar would just show up out of nowhere and volunteer information? Are you not skeptical in any way? Because I am. But... Fleet is a cynic, right? He can be. He's seen a lot of bad stuff. Be careful around the burial stones. I don't want to haul you back to the ore basker on my back. All right. Looks like we're kind of taking point here. So what I'm going to do is opt to reinforce uh, some work that I want to do on my blocking skill. Quarters are very close here, so uh, when working with Farkas, I'm always looking for an opportunity to flank. Let him get in front. Okay, let's do this. Let's go ahead and level up now. We're going to put this into health. Now, I've invested a lot of points in stamina, uh, some in health and some in magica. At this point, we're going to be investing a bit more in health going forward. Now, as far as perks go, because I happen to be working on blocking a little bit right now, we will take the first perk in block mastery um, what I like about this idea right now is we're going to invest in health and this is kind of a cool way for us to simulate the idea of fleet trying to get back into shape trying to recover from all the time that he spent um, inactive right I mean two years would take a toll on a person, especially a warrior. So he's supposed to be in, you know, peak fighting condition is what he is what he's striving towards. And uh, the aim of joining up with 
Kodlak and, and his people is to sort of make that process go a little bit faster, I guess. All right, we're going to take point. Old Norse sacrifice place. Be careful around here. Let's look for a way to open the bars. All right. Oh, Farkas. He kind of cracks me up. I'm growing to enjoy Farkas a little bit more. I've complained about him in other series prior. Um, but one of the things I like about Farkas is, you know, his, his dialogue and stuff like that, his, his lines are really true to the type of person he's supposed to be, even in very subtle ways. The fact that he calls this an old Nord sacrifice place, I think is kind of hilarious. And it's a, it's a subtle way of illustrating the fact that he's not, you know, he's not the, the sharpest tool in the shed, I guess. Um which I think is pretty cool. And he's a little bit easier to adventure with when you're adventuring with him as a warrior as opposed to a stealth character. If you're trying to adventure with Farkas as a stealth character, you may as well forget it. It becomes frustrating very quickly. Oh. Uh, hey. Who's the idiot now? <laughs> now look what you got yourself into. Yeah, yeah. No worries. I know. Just sit tight. I'll find the release. Oh. Behind you. What was that? It's time to die, dog. We knew you'd be coming. Your mistake, companion. Which one is that? Doesn't matter. There's five of Where's them. Where's that armor? Dies. Killing you will make for an excellent story. None of you will be alive to tell it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I hope I didn't scare you. What was that? It's a blessing given to some of us. We could be like wild beasts. Fearsome. You're going to make me a werewolf? Oh, no. Only the circle have the beast blood. Prove your honor to be a companion. Eyes on the prey, not the horizon. We should keep moving. Still the Draugr to worry about. Who are these people? We should keep moving. We're not going anywhere until you tell me what's going on. Bad people who don't like werewolves. So they don't like us either. I see. So the companions are werewolves. Not everyone. But all the circle are. It's a secret to everybody. Hmm. Now we're in on the secret, I all guess. Alright then. Well, let's look at them. They're not... They don't look like... Fanatics. They don't look like zealots. I mean, they're dressed like mercenaries. They're not dressed like... Priests or clergy, who is, you know, the type of person that you typically associate with this sort of zealous outlook, right? Something about it, I think, for Fleet doesn't compute. When he thinks of this type of zealotry where people would throw themselves at creatures as dangerous as werewolves and vampires, he thinks of Vigilance of Stendar. To, to him, that makes sense. This doesn't. So, this is going to be something we're thinking about. And he's going to be, given what we understand of you know, his thought process, how he can be sort of suspicious and jaded when you combine these individuals with some mysterious scholar who shows up out of the blue with free information. 
where most people maybe wouldn't be alarmed, he sees conspiracy. You know? So. Alright, let's do this. Charging power attack. What was it? Block. Come on, finish it. Okay. Skeever hide and mud crab. Chitin. We can make we can make our own cure disease potions out of that. So we're gonna take that. Gold. Can't just leave that laying around. That'd be silly. Um Okay. So uh, for those of you who are interested, I am playing currently at master difficulty, okay? And uh, I am very intentional about the way that I use the weapon that he's carrying right now so that it plays to the strengths of the perks I have selected. So I've got a crosscut perk, which gives me some bonuses on damage or possibilities of getting criticals if I follow up a normal attack with a power attack. And so I try to keep that in mind when I'm fighting and come up with, you know, some, some ideas about how I can do that, you know, how I can combine my attacks in ways that play to the strengths of the perks I've selected, that kind of thing. All right, Farkas, you got this guy. I'll, I'll put one on him, but you got him. I got this guy here. Oh. There we go. Ah. You got one on us, though. I'll tear you to pieces. Sneak attack. Okay. Look at this. Their, their armor's getting better. Get the impression that it's only going to get more difficult. Hmm. Were you expecting this kind of resistance? It feels an awful lot like a trap, right? So, we're going to proceed with some renewed caution going forward here. Lots of rings just laying around. Search this guy. Oh, there it was. Thank God for the skeleton key, huh? Exotic arrows. I'm going to keep those. Dwarven Sword of Frailty. I am not sure that I have that enchantment. Here's one of their number that probably got laid out by a draugr. Something like that. Okay. We'll quick save here. Huh. Let's keep going. Do 
Now, it becomes difficult, right? I mean, one of the things that, that Fleet has on his mind, right, is that he's supposed to be concealing his identity. So, um... That's part of the reason why he, he is electing to protect himself in, in more of what I would consider to be a mundane way here. Um, I do have a shout keyed up in case I get in a pinch, but we really don't want to use it. Uh, we, re we really want to refrain... Oh, man. Oh, man. Let's get the extreme healing going. This is going to hurt. This is going to hurt. Oh, yeah, we got to block it. <laughs> Ow. Come on, Farkas. You're supposed to be the tank here. Okay. Woo! That was close. Uh, that that last shot was kind of an example of the the combo there. One regular attack, a normal attack, followed up by a by a power attack. Not the way that I usually like to execute it. Doesn't look very elegant, but. I like that uh, Ordinator gives you opportunities to benefit from thinking about your attack combos rather than just mashing the button as, as many times as, as possible, as quickly as possible in battle. It uh, forces you to think about it a little bit, which has the effect of feeling a bit more like an actual fighting style, I guess, which is pretty cool. One of the things I love about Ordinator Plus, it's a complete perk overhaul that doesn't require me to do any patching or crazy stuff, which I really appreciate. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, there's a guy up there. Okay. They're coming. Let's draw. We're going to draw them out here, though. I don't want to be fighting them in that dark alcove. Son of a bitch. Come on, Farkas. Okay, we're going to flank. You won't live to see Tony. you. There's the combo. Like. We're going to fall back a little bit. Farkas has got the heavier armor, so we're going to let him lead in against that archer. Where is that archer? Gotcha. Ha! Fleet doing what Fleet does. Love it. Okay. Uh, antique honed silver sword. Let's take one of those. Looks like a fairly distinctive weapon. We're going to take a couple of these silver weapons. Um, Fleet's going to want to ask some questions, figure out what's going on with the Silver Hand. Um, uh uh. Don't step on it, please. This feels very Is someone there? ambushy. Time to end this stupid game. <laughs> Got him. Get that archer. Get that archer. Come on, Farkas. 
Okay, that was, we took some shots there. Skeever hide, another one of these mantles. Taking that. All right, there's conflict going on here somewhere. someone on guard here. Okay. Well, we're coming to the conclusion here. Farkas and I. That we've gotten much more than we bargained for in here. This is definitely a trap laid by the silver hand for the companions and they've thrown a lot of people into this which means we got to we got to change up our tactics a little bit so we're we're doing we're being a little bit more careful a bit more stealth work here quietly is someone there time to end this day Marcus come on get in there okay who's got a bead on us now nobody okay Could we be so lucky that the Draugr took out the other ones? Somehow I doubt that. job. Stun him. There we go. We give Farkas these opportunities once in a while, but he, he doesn't always take us up on them. Ouch. Come on, do your tank thing. I, you know, I gotta say, if you're if you're willing to be a bit more of a stand-up fighter, working alongside of Farkas, you can actually get some decent work done. Um, there, are, obviously, there are opportunities to do, you know, stealth attacks and infiltration kind of stuff. But 
I think the real strength in fighting with him is is if you can get him to move ahead of you and tank a little bit, it gives you this ability to really um, go after the flanks, you know, and 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 do it in a number of different ways. So I am liking that a lot. Even though he can ruin your stealth sometimes and stuff like that, in the heat of combat, it doesn't matter quite so much, right? Because your enemy is distracted anyway. That gives you an opportunity to do these flanking attacks and get some extra damage and all that good stuff. All right. Really? There we go. So the bone meal, I am taking bone meal when I find it, just because hey. I can use that for doing enchanting stuff on the road. Bone meal is an ingredient for my enchanting equipment. Okay, let's search these guys. Say what you like about the silver hand. Um, you can really cash in on these guys with all the, the silver and the healing and the cure disease potions they carry and, you know, all that kind of stuff. They carry some really good stuff. So you can walk away with, I think, a lot of it if you're paying attention, which I do on occasion. Okay. All right. Let's continue on. All right, shield brother. Whoa. Vermin. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeesh. No matter how hard I try, one of those Skeever always manage to get through. Every time I fight Skeever, it's the same story. Okay. Ooh. Let's see you. Ooh -hoo -hoo. Close. Ooh. Right in the gullet. Good job, you got the little one. <laughs> okay. Now, becoming more of a stand-up swordsman is something that Fleet sort of elected to do later in life. Uh, there we go. So, it's been kind of a process. Oh, this is not good. Not good at all. Um, where's Farkas? God dang it. you. Running out of stamina is the kiss of death for this character. If I can't block, I am well and truly screwed. Alright, well, we've certainly made it further through this crawl than the Silver Hand made it. I think that's an accomplishment. Oh, here we go. Wait. 
song of the word wall. We haven't heard this in years. Ah, so now you know my secret. And you're eating bread. Okay. Well, from a role-playing perspective, the cat's out of the bag. Farkas has seen him absorb power from the wall. So... The assumption is that Farkas would know what that means. Maybe he wouldn't. I don't know. Um, I'm going to go under the assumption that he might. He's not saying anything we about it. We should keep moving. Until next time. All right, well, look at this, my friend. Here's your piece of Wuthrad. I have a feeling we're not going to be allowed to simply take it, however. Let's get up here. All right, so let's let's form a strategy. Judging by the number of doors here, there's going to be a lot of enemies. And we're going to have to fight them to get out. So, my hope is that Farkas will play his part and basically gather up all their aggression while I work around the fringes and we'll see what happens. I think the, the most difficult thing is going to be maintaining mobility, keeping my stamina up. These smaller guys, I can one-shot them, particularly if I've got a running start. But the big guys, the Death Lords, that is not going to work on them. Shot of healing. Let's look at stamina. Oh, our stamina is pretty good. Charging power attack. Oh, nice. missed it. Let's get some distance. in here. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, man. This is not good. Can't allow ourselves to get flanked. There's no one down. Come on, come on, come on. Oh my god. Okay, we gotta get out of here. Good job, Farkas. Holy hell. Okay, here we go. Now we're whittling away at him. There it is. Down you go. Oh man, they keep coming. Oh god, another death lord. Oh 
Holy hell. How are we doing there in stamina? Boy. I need stamina too. Well, we'll burn a lot of potions, but I don't have a choice. There we go. Now I got a little bit of room to maneuver. I'm not having to spend so much time just... Chop. Follow her attack. Follow up. Now I got him flanked. We can work them together now. There we go. Is that it? Oh my god. All right, Shield Brother. Have I earned my keep here or not? Woo. Thank God for mobility. Mobility. Boy, I had to do a lot of running there just to stay in it. It, you know, I didn't feel so bad when I was fighting regular Draugr, but when I looked up and it was just four or five spiky helmets, then I started freaking out a little bit because that's when it gets bad. What? Oh, wait a minute. What are you doing? Oh, he's freaking out. Barkus has his blood up. We'll let him take care of it. Lots of ebony weapons in play here. Yeah, that got a little bit scary there, but that was pretty fun, too. Skior said that this was supposed to test our metal, and I think it did. That's a lot of Draugr and a lot of Death Lords at Master Difficulty. And light armor. I feel pretty good about that. And Farkas kind of did for us what we needed him to do, which was to gather up all that aggression and give us an opportunity to work around the edges. For the most part, we could do that. There was a point there where he went down for an extended period of time, and uh, I got a little concerned, but thankfully there was enough room to maneuver around that we could keep moving. All right, let's stay on our guard. We're not out of here yet. I think we may have uh, acquired a level or two in blocking just in that one battle as well. That was, that was a pretty good deal. <laughs> All right.
Thank you once again, dear viewers, for watching another Couch Warrior TV story experience. May all that you do be swift, silent, and deadly, and to all Skyrim assassins, I salute you. Silence is our battle cry. You have been watching Featherstone, an Aranus Arcana story. For more information, character development podcasts, weekly Patreon live streams, silent battle cry gear, and more, visit Couch Warrior TV on the web at www.charactercrusade.com. If you enjoyed this story, hit that subscribe button and make sure you don't miss a single episode. I'll see you next time.